Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 Podcast. We're your hosts, Suzanne Kearns and Missy Stevens. We want to help you through everything that happens in the ellipses, from your professional life to your emotional health. You're a mom and so much more. Let's figure out what comes next together. Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 Podcast. I'm Missy Stevens, Mom and Dot 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 Writer, Foster Care Advocate, and today, Snow Slash Ice Day Cruise Director at my house. Good luck with that. And I'm Suzanne Kearns, Mom and Dot 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 Writer, LGBTQ and Sex Ed Advocate. And today, really curious if my son got on the two-hour delay bus. We'll find out later. <laughs> So today we are so thrilled to have Shelly Hayes McMahon and Crystal Mason with us to talk about voters' rights. I have known Shelly for years, and I was trying to think where at the first place where we ever met was, but I can't even pinpoint it because she's everywhere. She's either. everywhere. <laughs> she's like Roy Kent. She's here. She's there. She's every fucking where. She's like, she's at campaign <laughs> events, capital rallies. I have to show my daughter did the illustrations for this great book. This, uh, I am an activist coloring book and oh, I, amazing. she drew the back of, I believe this is the back of your head, isn't it Shelly? <laughs> yes. <that is. laughs> so, so our whole family has a special connection to Shelly um, and, and just love her. She's a fierce advocate for women from all walks of life, stepping into roles of power. She is currently the deputy director of Planned Parenthood Texas Votes and was the director of operations at Annie's List, is a co-president for the Political Action of Black Austin Democrats, senior advisor and treasurer for the Williamson County Democratic Party and a Williamson County precinct chair. I mean, you talk about voter rights again, in right? <laughs> involved. Yeah. Yes. And she also sits on the board of Big Brothers, Big Sister Central Texas and the Barbara Jordan Leadership Institute. She is a 2020 Leadership Austin graduate, 2021 NLC mentor and an ordained minister. I did not know that. That is so cool to talk about that later. Awesome. She is a frequent political contributor for Pink Granite and The Rebel. Before joining Planned Parenthood Texas Votes, Shelley spent 30 years in management as well as running for office in 2018. Her belief is that the most vulnerable in our society must be protected, and the best way to do that is by electing more pro-choice, progressive women to office. Here, 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 yes. And Crystal Mason is the founder of Crystal Mason the Fight Foundation. The foundation is dedicated to fighting against voter suppression. She has a personal story of trials, tribulation, and triumph, and through that story, she has become the face of voter suppression. In 2016, Crystal did what any noble American would do and cast her vote at the ballot box, hoping to be the change that she wants to see. Instead, she was given a five-year prison sentence after casting a provisional ballot that was ultimately rejected in the 2016 election. Crystal is adored by her family, friends, and colleagues. She is a mother, grandmother, and successful business owner. If asked who she is, Crystal will tell you, I am a rehabilitated felon that believes in second chances. So do we. So do we. Oh, we're so honored to have both of you here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. So we often talk about how stay-at-home moms have the power to really change the world if they claim their power and take advantage of, I don't even want to say flexible schedules. We know moms are busy, but they're relatively <laughs> flexible schedules to be a megaphone for the voices yeah. of those who are either limited by the constraints of working hours, societal pressures, or their own personal safety. And our hope is that listeners will be moved by Crystal's story and really see voting rights through a new lens and take that next right step to vote, to share information, stop disinformation, and to become more politically active. So yes. Shelly, can you tell us, we talked about your incredible bio, but can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, including how you met Crystal and what drew you to her story? Well, to go along with the theme of the podcast, I am a mom, dot, 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 mm -hmm. multiple other things. I've got two amazing um, teenage Black men that I am raising along with my husband. I became politically active, I think, uh, with a lot of women in my demographic, which is, you know, middle-aged suburban mom around Hillary Clinton and the, mm -hmm. just the possibility of having a woman president, you know, and then of course mm -hmm. we ended up with Obama and everything was fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, I, I think that was the first time I really like worked on a campaign and went out and did all of the things. 
and it just it just kind of never stopped after that but crystal my sis here crystal i remember seeing a it was a social media post talking about her story and i'm 99 sure i reached out to you via instagram to see if because i had this idea we were doing endorsements um with black austin democrats and i was going to have an entire room of central texas legislators held captive and my thought was you know what if anybody's going to be able to help her it's going to be them and if i can get her in front of them and they can't go anywhere it's going to, <laughs> it's going to be perfect yes so crystal joined us the board of black austin democrats and our central texas delegation plus kurt watson and she she told them her story her lawyer also joined us so you know we kept within all, all of the legal boundaries for her case and then i mean her story brought them to tears it was just it was so much emotion behind what had happened to her what was still happening to her and what republicans were trying to perpetrate around her case just the narrative around her case so she and i you know i i feel spiritually connected to crystal because she is just she is everything that the fight embodies when we come when we talk about voting rights and we talk about mm -hmm. um voter suppression i love her dearly i have to love her from afar because she lives up north and i'm down here but <laughs> she she is in my thoughts and prayers every day i will text her and just let her know hey i'm thinking about you today <laughs> what you need i i got a feeling but yeah she is <laughs> just you know what i'll just i'll let her tell her story and We'll just switch it on over to her. Wonderful. Well, that was the perfect lead in to Crystal telling her story. And we know that you cannot tell us a lot of details of your case, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more just about who you are outside of that case, what you're doing for voters' rights, your relationship with Shelly, your relationship with your family and friends, whatever you're comfortable telling us about. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, my name is Crystal Mason. And just to give you an intro of the beginning, um, I had a white collar offense and I went to the feds that did time. When I got out, I, I kept, I kept telling my kids that, Hey, when I got out, Hey, even though you hit that bump in the road, you can still get back on track. So I got out, I was in school, full-time student, working a full-time job, just getting everything back on track and got insurance for the kids again, just things that they had missed while I was gone. Yeah. yeah. Important things. And, um, my mom, her house, well, this is my household, but she was running a household while I was gone. So she's real big with keeping these voter registration cards together. Anybody that's 18 years old, she has these voter registration cards for them already, and it's time to go to the poll. So it. mom, I remember, I'm working a full-time job, just got out, just going to school, strengthening my family ties with the kids, activities, school, and everything else. So mom was like, hey, you know, you got you know, you got to go vote, Crystal. I was like, okay, mom, yeah, I got you. I'm going to do this. And she was just like, <laughs> it was the last day. I was getting ready to go to work, getting up early in the morning. And she got up and she's like, hey, you noticed the last day to vote. I said, mom, I'm going. So at that time I knew I wasn't going to school because if I go to school, I miss it. So I got off work. When I got off work, went to the polling place. And to the same polling place I went to in 2012. I've been living in my house in 08. So I go to the local church and I go and I say, um, I'm here to vote. And they looked for my name. They didn't see my name. So the mm. first thing in my mind, I thought, well, I gave mom power of attorney of the kids, power of attorney of the house and everything. So maybe I'm not on the poll anything. So I have a hyphenated name. They looked both ways and it was like, well, wow, you know? So I got ready to go. It was late, dark, and it was ready. So it was time for me to go. And a 16 year old guy told me, hey, you can fill out a provisional ballot. And I said, well, what's that? He said, if you're at the right location, it'll count. And if you're not, it won't. I'm like, that's easy. Go ahead and do this. Mm -hmm. So a lady came. She took my ID. She left. She walked. She came back. She was set a couple tables back from the entry place. And she kept telling me, make sure everything matches your ID. And I was like, okay, that's easy. So I was just filling out the forms and I made sure everything matched. And I went to go to the booth. And I asked her, um, I said, I, I wanted to do a straight ticket. And she got up, she showed me, and then she moved out the way I did. I put everything in the back and I left. I received a call from my supervised release officer. And she said she needed me to come in. And I was like, that's, you know, because once you deal with, you're done with your fed time, you, 
you know, something called supervised release. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you pretty much, you fill out a form every month and you really don't go meet anybody, you know, they they can call you in randomly to go to a UA or, you know, just to see mm -hmm. what, what you're doing, ask for a paycheck stuff or something, but it's, it's like randomly, like every six months. Mm -hmm. So when she called me, I'm thinking like, okay, well, maybe this is the UA. Okay. So I, I didn't take a lunch to get off work early to fly over there because I had to go to school. And I get over there and she said, hey, how you doing? And I was like, I'm fine. And she was like, that's it. Like weird. So I go downstairs. When I go downstairs, a lady asked me, she said, are you Crystal Mason? I said, I am. She said, go ahead and put your hands behind your back. You're being arrested for illegally voting. I said, what? I, I didn't illegally vote though. I, I, I went back to thinking, like I put everything right that was on, the, on my driver's license. Like I didn't illegally vote. Mm -hmm. And she said being on probation, you're ineligible to vote. And I was like, wow. But I'm thinking like this, we get the right location because my supervised release officer is upstairs. So let's go talk to her so we can figure this out. Mm -hmm. I go to jail. When oh I get out God. of jail, yeah, when I get out of jail, the feds just say, oh, we're just going to set this aside. And that's what they did. And study stepping up and saying, hey, we did something very, very wrong. We don't have something in place. This is absolutely wrong. They didn't. They just Moved over out the way, and I went through the procedure with, with the state case. So I got a call. I kept, my attorney kept telling me, oh, this is going to be an open and closed case. This is going to be an open and closed case. And um, 2018, April, he said, we're going to trial. He told me three days before. And I was like, what? We're going to trial? He's like, yeah. He told me this. My judge, my federal judge, he's a very harsh judge, Judge McBride. If anybody know him, you can look him up. And so with my, my nonviolent white collar offense, my, my choice, the governor, the governor said, give me probation, but my, my judge don't do plea deals. He gave me five years. So knowing what type of judge I got, when my attorney told me, Hey, Crystal, do you want to do a trial by jury or a, tra a trial by judge? He said, well, let me tell you this. You're the judge has practiced up under McBride, so he know how he is. So he'll know that you'll never do anything to go back before his court again. That's the reason why I didn't do a trial by jury. Because if I would have did a trial by jury, I wouldn't be here today. But I, I did a trial by judge. And in my trial, they put on a whole, I was, first of all, I was the only witness. My, my attorney didn't do anything. I didn't have no character witness. I didn't even get who was the witnesses that was against me. I would have known it was my neighbor across the street, but we could, that's a, that's a long story on that end. So I'm going through trial and I'm looking like, wow, like this is for real. My supervised release officer, supervisor, the U.S. probation officer of Northern District, Kenneth May, testified on the stand and said, no, we never told her she couldn't vote. No, she never said anything. So we got the judgment and commitment. They didn't say anything that I was eligible to vote. You have your terms of supervised release that says no felons, no drugs, no, it lists everything down. It tell me I was ineligible to vote. Yet the judge found me guilty and sentenced me to five years for illegally voting, for filling out a provisional ballot that never counted. So um, it was devastating. I mean, I had to think like I was about to go to prison. I'm about to go to prison right now. So this was the same attorney that I had for my federal. So I had think like, what do I do? And I told him, I want to appeal. He's like, oh, we, we can wait. I'm like, no, I want to appeal now. And then mm -hmm. I appealed. The, the judge came back and he signed the appeal for And I don't know why, but he was like, I want to appeal. And it just came out of my mouth because my yeah. attorney wasn't helping me. That's good. Well, it's I, coming I, out of my I, mouth already yeah. too. I want to yeah, like the attorney. He didn't help me at all. He didn't tell me nothing. So I was like, I want to appeal. Bond. Anything that's up under 10 years, non-valid, you can get an appeal bond and stay out on. So he granted me an appeal bond, and that's the reason why I'm out today. And I looked at um, so many people. They're they're like, oh no! You, you look at I'm a I'm a mother, I'm a black mother with kids, and they're, they're sending me to prison for voting. And what does that do? It scares the people from the puckle. They're like, oh yeah. no, I'm not voting. I'm not going to do it. Whenever you it's second guessing yourself now because you're like, oh no. I got a felony. I got a felony. But in the state of Texas, even if you have a felony, as long as you have discharged your sentence and your time, you're eligible to vote. But yeah. 
because of the way it just happened to me, people were scared. They were scared to go to the poll. Yeah. And that was and, the very first thing that popped into my head after learning about your case. If you look at it in the context of the larger voting rights fight going on in the country, it is. It's just sowing that confusion. It's by design. It, it just is so clear to me that this is by design to try to confuse people who are at risk or who are at fear. It might be because of the color of their skin or it might be because of their immigration status. Whatever the case may be, it's just scaring them out of voting because they... It's targeted voter suppression. Correct. Yes. It is by design design. I mean, mm -hmm. there there is an intention behind this. The goal is not to protect us from voter fraud. The goal is no. to not, not have people of color voting. I mean, let's just say <laughs> what it is. It's and it's, it's so disgusting. It's so clear, especially the night that I was inviting Shelly onto the show. Um, it just happened to be the next day, I think. I was watching Rachel Maddow, and she did a special about, um, it was Pamela Moses, so it wasn't yeah. your story, but so, I mean, it might as well have been so similar. Mm -hmm. She got six years instead of five, and she lives in Tennessee. But she contrasted it to four white men, Republicans, not, I mean, I guess we can call this a, is this a bipartisan issue? I don't know. It, it gets a little partisan for me, but um, okay, let's so, just call it what it is. Yeah. So the, these four men who intentionally took the voter form for a deceased relative. So, I mean, yeah. they know that I am not my mom. I am not my dead wife. I am not my whoever. They filled that out and turned it in. I mean, to me, that that's voter fraud. What, what you did was a, it was a mistake. It was an accident from not having the correct information. And the vote never even counted. Yeah, you let's, know. let's make That's that right. clear. It was a provisional ballot. Right. But these these four guys who filled out ballots for deceased relatives just basically got a slap on the hand. No one had prison time. I think a couple had probations. Um, so I just want to really highlight that. And we will link to that, uh, Rachel mm -hmm. Maddow segment because it was it's yeah. so powerfully laid out like wow there's this is racist it's it's racism it's right it's not a law right. that is meant to treat all americans equally along their ability to vote so no and i don't think it's simple to figure out like you said you had all this paperwork none of it laid out i you're not allowed to vote if somebody isn't First of all, sometimes you don't even know to ask that question, I guess. You don't even know to yes. ask, can I or can I vote? But if you think to ask that question or someone in your life says you need to find out, where do you even go find that out? How do you even figure out if you can or can't vote? It just seems way overly complicated to me. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. Who do you call? Is there a yeah. website, Shelly? Where, where do we go <laughs> to find out if we're eligible to vote? <laughs> Yeah, and I think that there's an important distinction between voter suppression and voter intimidation. Mm. Um, mm. A lot of our laws right now are not only designed to suppress, but they are also designed to intimidate, right? So in Crystal's case, and, and with a lot of other rehabilitated felons, you know, once they're off paper, and you know, that's, that's our phrase, once they're off paper, mm -hmm. they can vote. But when they see things like Crystal's case and what happened in Tennessee and what happens to other accidental voters and the extremes that Republicans will go to to punish them, it intimidates them from voting, yeah. right? So right. It, I think there's there's a big, uh, there's two buckets there. It's, yes, we're trying to suppress the votes of people of color across the United States, but we, there's also this this undercurrent of intimidation that happens, Right. You know, as we look at everything that's happening around the country, the narrative that comes out of that, even with the media, is designed for that underlying intimidation, right, beneath the suppression. And yeah. another thing, you know, when, and I'm going to say we, because I'm a part of it too. When we get out, we get out with pretty much nothing. I was just lucky to have all my stuff together, renew my license and everything before I went. So I had everything together. You got people that come home, and when they come home, the first thing they give us is um, they got their social security card, and they have a piece of paper that we get from the, the county hospital, 
so we can get insurance. We take both those forms and we take it to the drops license place to get ID. When we get an ID, you know what they ask us? Hey, would you like a second form of identification? So we say yes, because we're trying to right. build our information up. Yeah. We check the box for a voter registration card. Now, this is the killer part right now because we're still in jail. We're just at the halfway out. So we're still doing our time. Mm-hmm. They send us the voter registration card to the halfway house. So you're giving us something that you don't tell us we can't even use. So how do we what? know if we can vote or not? Yeah, and I have plenty because I have to go to prison again because it violated me. And when I came home, that's when I see it. When, in 2019, when I came home, people were running like, I, they, I got a voter registration card. I got to make so scared. I'm like, just, they just gave it to me. And I'm like, hey, because who, who tells us we can't use it? Can... Right. It's sad. Oh, okay. It's like, that's, I mean, that's okay. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I got, I got <laughs> our, that our brains are going. Because, uh, yeah, in my mind, I was like, okay, it's just a matter of not knowing. And I mean, you've got so many other things that you're trying to get together. You're getting your job. You're getting your life back together. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things you don't even know that you don't know. It's, no. Oh. But this is beyond not knowing that you don't know. I mean, they're teasing you with it. They're just, Absolutely. I mean, that's so mm-hmm. confusing. Mm-hmm. Why, is it, why is it nothing set up in the system to automatically stop it? Why do you give us a form? but not tell us we can't use. Do you know when I went to go to vote, you know how many people called me to tell me that they voted? That was on supervisor lease with me. Yeah. And they were so mm-hmm. scared. I just said, leave it alone and just be quiet. You know, just, just be quiet. You know, because yeah. no one told us. You don't have it nowhere. And it's almost like, is it rehabilitation or really are you setting us up? You know, are you setting us up to- It feels like a trap. Us- it feels like-, like a trap. Exactly. Exactly. I had no idea. Okay. So I learned, okay. So this kind of leads into my next question. Many of our listeners like Missy and I are white privileged ladies who do, do not even know what we don't know about what Mm -hmm. it feels like to vote when you are a person of color. And so we don't, we don't feel the severity of, I mean, there's the discrimination, there's the intimidation. There's so much going on right now nationally and statewide as far as either trying to increase voter rights or take away voter rights like but what what is it like what is it like for you like are you feeling that when you go in the voting line are you feeling that in a systemic way or in a day-to-day way when it comes to voting as a black woman in america you know i think there's a again the larger conversation for those of us with privilege and non-melanated It's this need to be outraged when something doesn't affect you personally, right? It's the knowledge and the the care that has to be taken around issues that don't live in your backyard, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going back to 2013 with uh, Shelby County versus Holder, where Justice Roberts has had this, I mean, dude's been on a tear for years around just gutting voting rights. And what he did in 2013 is what led to everything that is happening or has happened since then, which was getting rid of the preclearance formula that was in the Voting Rights Act. And what the preclearance formula did, it was it said that states had to go to either the DOJ or federal courts if they were going to make any changes to any sort of elections or voting um, happenstances in their states. Because he said, and this is a quote, The policy had been so successful at curbing discriminatory practices that it was no longer justified. Yeah. It's all fixed. We're just going to go back. It's all fixed. We're just going to, yeah, we're going to go back to trusting, you know, old white men to do the right thing. (laughs) Yeah. So now all of these things that are happening since that ruling is the fruit of that tree. It's the Mm -hmm. fruit of what he planted. So Texas has gone gusto with it. Georgia has done it. Tennessee, Kentucky. All of these states are consistently figuring out ways to disenfranchise voters, make it harder to vote, intimidate voters, and then basically just take away the rights of voters, either through voter ID laws, closing polling places, just anything that they can can possibly do. Mm -hmm. So the John Rights Voting Act brings back the the full body of the Voting Rights Act. It, It puts the changes back under review which is where we need to be. You know, we're fighting in the courts right now and we're 
fighting against, oh, so many Republican appointed judges Mm -hmm. who, again, do not care about voting rights, that unless we are, one, we need to change the composition of the Supreme Court. Come on, Joe Biden and Black woman. And then two, yes, we have to vote. We have to vote in every single election. We have to, all of these legislators that we have right now in the Texas House, Democrats are so outnumbered. They're just, they're just holding back the tide. You know, they're doing everything Mm -hmm. that they can. It's just hanging on by a string and our voting rights are hanging on by a string Mm -hmm. along with, you know, bodily autonomy and the rights of trans families and kids, just all of these things. But the precipice of that, that what tipped it over was eliminating the protections around voting rights. It started this, what's the word? Um, How can we take away, uh, yes, avalanche. How can we take away another right? How can we take away another right? How can we take away another right? How can we overturn elections? You know, how can we drive this narrative around elections aren't safe and, you know, Democrats are stuffing ballot boxes and there's so, so much, what's the word? Um, well, sorry, sure. I still have, I, well, that's <laughs> also a good word. I still have a, I got a little bit of COVID brain, so oh, sorry. it takes me a second, but the, the conspiracy theories around just all of this nonsense, all of it started in 2013. You know, in Eric Holder's organization, um, All on the Line, uh, you know Genevieve, right? Genevieve works. She is the the Texas person for All on the Line. So she does a lot of organizing around getting folks to go and testify um, at the legislature around voter suppression, training, just all of these things. But she works for Eric Holder, who, you know, was the AG for President Mm -hmm. Obama. So there are so many organizations out there right now that are trying to do the groundwork, including Crystal's nonprofit which I'm hoping she will talk about. And, you know, voting as a Black person in this state, I took my son to go vote for the first time in this primary election. And I do the talk that we always have before we literally go anywhere, before we go to Target, before we go to HEB, just is how he has to be once we get inside of a space where we may not necessarily be welcome or we may be the only Black face. And that talk was, you know, you have your... You have your sample ballot. I want you to make sure you keep your sample ballot very clear and very in sight of whoever is observing the election. You're going to tell them that you're asking for assistance and your assistance is me. And I'll find a little affidavit there. I'm an election judge too. It's crazy. Ah. But we'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get into that later. But you know, when we walked in, there's just this all eyes on you kind of thing. I'm up here in Williamson County. So everybody turns and looks and, you know, we're six feet tall. We're not small people either. (laughs) (laughs) You're not sneaking in. (laughs) Yes. We are not sliding in anywhere, you know, and he, he goes up to the election clerk, gives him his ID and the guy is asking him, he asked him a couple of questions. He asked him what, what was his address, which is not the correct question. You're supposed to ask what is Mm-hmm. You're supposed to, it, we are supposed to ask, what is your current address? Right. And uh-huh. then the other thing that, yeah, it's a whole thing. <laughs> it's a whole thing. So uh-huh. I stopped and I'm like, you know, that's not the correct question. You're supposed to ask him, what is his current address? And the guy was like, well, and I'm like, no, not well. Yeah. Do it right. <laughs> we will do this right. So he went through all of that. Um, And then Mason signed his thing and then he told him he wanted assistance and he was calling over this other cute white kid, whatever, (laughs) was calling him over and Mason was like, no, I want my mom to help. And this guy tried to tell him that it had to be an election worker who helped him. And I was like, bruh, we're not doing this today. (laughs) One, I know the rules. I know the rule. And two, I mean, it's just mind blowing to me. That the the liberties they think they can take with our, with our voting rights, yeah, right. So we go through all the things. Bob goes and um, cast his ballot. The other thing that was interesting about our voting experience was the elections clerk tried to tell us that we had to use the same machine. He and I did, and I was like, "No, I'll just use the machine next to him. Thank you so much." Mm-hmm. And she was like, "No, I need you to vote on the same machine that he does." And I'm like, "Ma'am, why?" why? Exactly. <laughs> why? why is this a thing? And she could not tell me why she wanted me. She just wanted me to vote on the same machine. 
It's not a rule. Mm-hmm. It's not a law. It's nothing. So it's it's very important that we know our rights as people of color when we go to vote, because there you have people who are they've worked elections for years and years and years, and they have their own personal rules around um you see them when you get there they're a thousand years old (laughs) ma'am i mean ma'am yes (laughs) there's a there is a lot of that and things have changed especially over the last couple years with our last um legislative session with poll watchers poll watchers have way too much leeway now but we went through poll watcher training when i went for my, my election judge training this time around but voting as a person of color and I'll tell you, it's one of the reasons I work election. It's just so Black people see me see when they come. Yeah, when yeah. they come in to vote, you know, and it's not that I'm making an election safer or anything. I do follow the rules, but I think there's just a, it's a little bit of a sigh of relief mm. when you see somebody who looks like you. It's yeah, a little oh, more yeah. welcoming. It's a little more just all of the things that you need to be comfortable in a space. And when we are the only only is lonely, as we say, when we, yeah. <laughs> when we are the only, it can be very intimidating. It can cause you to rush through the voting process. Yeah. It can cause you to not go back and check your ballot. You know, it just, I want you to come in, take your time, do what you need to do, ask for help if you need help. And if you're not comfortable asking a non-melanated person for help, then you have someone who looks like you mm-hmm. in the, in the, at the poll. So but to your point, Suzanne, yeah, I went for my election judge training. I was the youngest person in the room. I'm 52 years old. <laughs> I love being the youngest person in the room. <laughs> and uh, It doesn't happen to me often anymore. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, that there is a gap um, yeah. between 75 and 50 some odd, you know, and even the 40 some odds yeah. where there's no representation there. So. Yeah, it's it's a lot. And I feel like I am just wandering all over the place. But well, you've <laughs> you've said so many important things. And I want I know we can't boil it down. There's no boiling this issue down. My stomach is in knots. I feel nauseated. I'm angry. I want our listeners to feel angry too, because I think that's part of changing this. Mm-hmm. Is there something if somebody's listening and they're saying I'm angry, I have no idea where to start. What is the first thing they need to start paying attention to, to make a a change here? I mean, it's systemic, it's broken, it's so old. Where do we start today? I think depending on where you are, look at what's going on in your state. You know, look at what's happening at your state legislature. Look at what's happening around redistricting lines being drawn in your state, because those are also drawn to, you know, suppress and disenfranchise voters, especially voters of color. Get involved in that. Secondary is vote. I mean, oh my yeah. God. And you have to vote in line with your your personal beliefs. And if your personal beliefs have not taken on a lens of anti-racism, there is a good chance that you may not be voting in the best interest of people who don't look like you. I would advise folks to, to listen to people of color, to listen to listen to Black women. You know, we are very, very well aware of what happens if we stop fighting, if, mm-hmm. if we get too tired and we just, we just lie down. My biggest piece of advice is to not wait until an issue has a white voice. Mm. So many times mm-hmm. our, we can talk about black women have been screaming about abortion rights for years. We can talk about voter suppression, but until it comes out of a non-melanated faith, Mm-hmm. It may not be taken seriously by non-melanated people. Yep. So when we say listen to Black women and we say listen to people of color, I'm literally saying listen to them. You don't have to wait until it comes out of a white person's mouth for it to be taken seriously. You don't have to wait for a white person to say, hey, we need to raise money around this issue when a person of color has been telling you for years that this is coming. There's a, there's a dearth of, of fundraising for Black-led organizations, Latina-led mm-hmm. organizations, LBGTQIA plus um, led organizations until a white voice says, hey, 
I need to go help them. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> or yeah. and, unless there is uh, at times a white person in charge of the organization. So you will see right. that there's a lot of, um, there's discomfort that has to be dealt with, right? And sometimes you have to live in that discomfort and just kind of push through it. But for the people who are in their bubbles, right? And for that's a lot of suburban moms. Oh yeah, right now. Um, uh huh. <laughs> I'm I'm a suburban mom. I'm just not the suburban mom they're talking about when they're hollering, right. about, you know, anti CRT and all of those things. Nobody asked me about that. <laughs> uh, when they talk to those suburban moms, they're just talking to the white suburban mom. They're skipping over the the black ones, yeah, and the yeah. the South Asian ones and the Latinas yeah. who are all out here in Cedar Park. <laughs> but it's for women who are you know, sort of bubble bound right now, the things that are happening are, are going to affect you eventually. Mm -hmm. You know, it might not be like a stab in the heart. It might be like a little pinprick or something along that line, but it is going to Mm -hmm. affect you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get active now. It is, you know, get active now, you know, go block walk for school boards. Oh, Let's take a boy. second to talk about school boards. Yes, oh ma'am. God. School boards. Mm-hmm. More important than the president, I think. More important than the president, I think. Ours is a flipping disaster. God. Yeah. <laughs> Ours is. is great, but it is one election away from not being. And people don't know right. that. People don't no, know they that don't. in Austin. And there is a concerted effort to put anti-CRT, anti-LGBTQIA plus candidates on school boards. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, there's testifying at school board meetings, but then, you know, if you got the gumption, go run for school board. I mean, <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know, if you can do it and you can get the support, go run for office. But it is, it's so important to see what is happening at the local level, school boards, city councils, county commissioners, all of those offices have so much to do with our everyday lives. You know, there's that saying that further down the ballot, the closer it is to your front door, mm, mm, their mm-hmm. policies, you know, mm-hmm. so city council down at the bottom of the ballot, school board down at the bottom of the ballot, all of those things are going to directly affect you if you, and you have to be involved. Um, right. I mean, we're, we're banning books now. Oh. Did anybody see that coming? Wait a minute. Right. I you did. <laughs> I did. I've been at the school board meetings. You've been, the you've been years. there. Yeah. You've been <laughs> yeah. at the school board meetings. You know, we're banning books. You know, we, Greg Abbott yesterday coming for trans kids again. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's Don't just, even. there are so many things that are happening to marginalized communities yeah. that we need the majority to get involved in. We need the majority to get angry about. We need the majority yeah. to pump funds into the fight against those things so i just feel like there's a willful ignorance going on Mm. like there are people who do not want to to learn more and i that comes from a place of fear it comes from a place of misinformation it makes them feel bad they don't want to feel bad Mm -hmm. yeah and i well i'm not going to get on my soapbox because that's not why we're here today but i feel encouraged by this conversation to figure out how to speak to those people in my life Mm-hmm. Missy, you have to get on your soapbox though. This yeah. is the thing is it is Crystal and I are not going to always be invited into the spaces that you are in yes. or the spaces that Suzanne is in, you know? So that's, that's discomfort and the, and the courage that you have to have as a white woman to call bullshit out when you see it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not like you're speaking for black people when you're in these right. spaces, you're right. speaking as a white woman who knows this bullshit is wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. again, the importance, the un- unfortunate importance right now of things not being taken seriously unless they are coming from a white voice. Mm-hmm. You've got a white voice. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you, you have to use it. And I tell white women this, I'm around white women a lot. I tell them <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the time is that if I'm not there, you don't have to speak for me, but you do need to talk about what's right. Yeah. And what's wrong. We call it a lot of being the megaphone. And this was one of the things that drove me to start my informed parents of Austin group. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not LGBTQ. My kids are not LGBTQ. 
but kind of like you said, I am invited into spaces where maybe a trans woman is not. Right. And mm -hmm. I can speak up again, not trying to put words in their mouth, but to be a megaphone and to mm -hmm. echo what what needs to be heard to keep them safe because yeah we do have access to the ears and i call in that case i've got straight privilege which is yeah. i people will listen to me in a different way than they would someone who they think that you know they've got a i hate to say dog in the fight i really need to find a better saying than that but to feel that you know this isn't for me this is just basic decent humanity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there is a fear there is a fear you're going to do it wrong and you just got to be willing to do it wrong and be corrected and keep moving because I think that is there probably are people who are just putting their head in the sand like an ostrich but then there are people who are these well-meaning white women who but don't want to like say the wrong thing or mm -hmm. you know I I can mess up someone's pronouns like nobody's business but you know what I'm still trying to speak up for in the arena I'm still trying to speak up for the LGBT mm -hmm. community and when I get something wrong I, I'll be like okay I'll get I'll work on that for next time yep. and just be willing to, to be wrong and, but to be, be wrong for the right thing and, to, <laughs> and, and to take that next step forward. And that Fair gives the did. person at that wine night, the permission next time that they go to a family dinner or whatever, to be able to say, Hey, yeah, Suzanne said this or Missy said this. So yeah, I think it is important and I'm going to bring it up here. Yeah. Yeah. Courage can be shared. You know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to live with one person that the one time you speak out, you're, you're handing some courage off to somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a, it, it really is, you know, that, that bravery that it takes to, to say the right thing in the wrong space, it's underappreciated, mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. um, the high five, you know, the secret high five, like, girl, you call that out, go right ahead. It's, mm -hmm. those are big <laughs> deals, you know, cause it encourages you to keep going and it encourages the person next to you listening to you take a stand and take a risk mm -hmm. at times to do the same thing so it's don't deny the power that you have right yeah. and you don't have to I hide the power that you have as white women and and or white people you are you are still empowered to speak right mm -hmm. it's not that you have to to think that you are speaking for another person like Suzanne said but you still have so much power there's power in your voice there's power in your story you know and and there's power in you standing up for the right things um it's yeah yeah and, and we just need it's to, a we lot just, we just need to have the courage to use it we're the ones that have the least to lose but for some reason we're the most precious about about the our voices and the way that we use them in community but oh my god we're getting so close to the end of our time and there's so much more to talk about here but crystal i want to hear about your nonprofit yes. and how people can support yes. it how people aside from voting for candidates up and down the ballot all the way down to the school board who support marginalized communities people of color what can we do support you in your case support you in so many ways well, with my situation, I realized that um, people were scared to vote. I seemed like when we went out to talk to people, they were like, oh, no, I'm a felon. I can't vote. No, no, no. You know, it automatically, it, my story pretty much was a Black woman with kids voted and now she's going to prison. Mm. So people black and brown was like, no, I'm not even going to take a chance. I don't mm -hmm. even. So I started my organization, Crystal Mason, the fight against voter suppression in 2020. And I wanted my story to encourage you to go to the polls, not to scare at you. So that's the reason why I was out canvassing in the neighborhoods and talking to people and letting them know if I don't know if you're ineligible to vote. If you're, if it's something, if it's a question I don't know, I have 12 attorneys that I can reach out to to get the right answer for you. Yeah. But I let them know the reason why it's so important to go to the polls, because I've always only voted in the presidential election. Now I voted, but only in the presidential ele election. Mm. And I realize it starts right here at home and that's the local elections. You understand the judge, the DA, the prosecutor, they're all elected officials. So all of them play the part in my case. So this is the reason why I go out and I network and I tell people about my story because we can go out there and we can make a change. And, and so we go out, I set up, we all 
registered voters, but we're all jeopardizing. My kids, I got like 12 men, members of my family. We're, we're registered in Tarrant County as well as Dallas County. And my kids are in Hawkins now. They go to college down there. So we're going to get that set up moving next year when we register all over again. And I set up voter registration drives everywhere. And I go out in the neighborhoods, cameras, and tell everybody, hey, I'm going to hold this event. We're going to have food and the bounce houses, things, activities for them to do. And I do this out of my pocket. So, you know, if you want to help or support me in any kind of way or e even join, my organization is crystalracingthefight.org. Or you can go to my GoFirmly page at hashtag justice, the number four, Crystal Mason. Wonderful. So now we usually end with our look, listen, learn segment, and it's usually kind of goofy and silly. And this subject is the, the opposite of goofy and silly, but uh, that's usually a time when we direct people to something that we've been reading or watching or learning mm -hmm. about that they can uh, work into their lives. So I would like to keep our look, listen, learn here focused on what women Probably most of our listeners are you know, suburban white ladies, um, what they can do to support voter rights. Um, I'll, I'll start with mine. Some one of the things that I would like people to take a look at, and we'll put the links to it in the show notes, is that uh, Rachel Maddow breakdown of Pamela Moses' case and, and how truly systematic racism is as far as the punishment for the white men who did something that was truly voter fraud versus a woman who had an accident <laughs> that made a mistake right. based on um, having misinformation about whether she was eligible to vote or not. Um, and then just last night or this week, uh, John Oliver has a piece on critical race theory. Uh, we'll put a link to that. And I think the main thing that came out of that, there's so many people, and they even had like Tucker Carlson on Fox News when someone was like, so what, you know, what is critical race theory? And he's like, oh, well, it's the idea that, you know, white people are bad and, you know, and one race is better than the other. And everybody's like, no, that's not what it is. So let's just clear it up here right now. What critical race theory is the idea that racism isn't just people who are racist, but the idea that the actual legal systems and policies, things that like we had talked about today have race baked into them. Um, so it's not just mm -hmm. one person, it's, mm -hmm. it's a system. Um, so if anybody's heard it, the term thrown around and didn't quite know what it was, that's what it was. And he does a really nice piece about breaking down. And again, talking about the school boards, I sat through all the state board of education, uh, the new health curriculum textbooks, you'd be You'd be shocked how the health textbook somehow became an anti-CRT messaging point for literally over 100 white ladies to get up and talk about. Um, so <sighs> it's coming. It's messages. coming. Yeah. They've yep. got they've got uh, a lot of time to spend and they got a lot of money to spend um, and they are coming for those school board seats. So take and those don't seriously. don't know what they're talking about. Oh, no. They, I mean, it started out like my fight was against, uh, they were fighting against sex ed and LGBTQ students. Then they just roll, they just take this mass of people and then they're like, now we're going to be anti-mask. Okay, what is it now? Now we're going to be burning books and now we are anti-CRT. And they just... They just migrate from cause to ugly cause and mm -hmm. and their strategy will be coming to take over the school board and that is going to hit you so directly. So be on it. Do you have any particular books or articles or things that you want to make sure that listeners uh, take a look at? She I'll start with Shelly. You're on my left. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out I do. Um, so <laughs> while you are... <laughs> While you were kicking in the media, um, it was, I love Rachel Maddow and I love John Oliver. Um, there are some amazing Black commentators out there. Um, mm -hmm. Tiffany Cross on the Cross Connection, Joy Ann Reed, um, Jonathan Cape Hart. He's, he's a Black gay man. I love his show. It's, it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, and there's an Instagram account called Black Women Views. Mm. She's, uh, Reese is amazing. So while, while you're taking in media, you know, make sure you're also listening to voices of color around yes. issues that affect people of color. I'm sorry, I'm choking to death today for some reason. But yeah, well, while you're choking, that is such a good point. Because look at me, look at me trying to be the woke white woman 
like listening to the white voices channeling, like you had said before, when the heads of the organizations, the white people are more likely to listen to it. I, yeah, look at me. Scary, right? I know. Scary. Look at me. Because you care. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yes, yes. Okay. So this is my book. This is Black Food by Bryant Terry. I literally have a cookbook on my bedside table. It it it. is not, it's a history of Black food across the diaspora. It also has Black art. There's a section on Black cooking in the queer community. I mean, it is just the most, I'll hold it up again so everybody can see it. It's called Black Food. It's a gorgeous cover. Gorgeous. Isn't it? Um, By Bryant Bryant Terry. Um, This is, it's stories, art, and recipes from across the African diaspora. And it's just, it's an amazing book. I have a cookbook on my bedside table. I don't even know how it happened, but my cousin <laughs> got it for me for Christmas. And Get it it's in the kitchen. Amazing, <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing book. I just, I'd encourage everyone to, to take a look at it. Love it. What about you, Crystal? Are any, any places that you'd like to direct anybody to for some looking, lo- learning or listening? Um, not today. Not today. No (laughs) problem. No problem. Did you have anything, Missy? Yeah, I do. I have, um, her name is Parker, but she goes by queen work on social media. It's queen with a K work with an E. And, um, I have been sharing her with my white friends. Uh, She talks a lot to white women, white people, but white women saying, this is what you can do this is what we need from you this is the bs we don't need from you Mm -hmm. um and she's funny and she's lovely and we've actually invited her to be on the show so i'm hoping at some point in the not too distant future she's on with us i found her i found her like i discovered her i came across her (laughs) on tiktok where i spend way too much time and follow her on tiktok and she's also on instagram doing it's mostly the same material Um, So whichever social media you like to waste your time on, she's there. And it is less of a waste of time when you have someone like Queen Work in your ear teaching you so much. Mm -hmm. So I recommend going and giving her a follow. Just did it. Good. (laughs) Wonderful. You're fast. She's awesome. Uh, Well, we almost got y'all out of here in time. We're so close. Three minutes (laughs) over. (laughs) But no, I bet this is a subject that needs way more time than the one hour here. So I hope people will continue to follow up. Um, We'll put some additional links in the show notes for some other look, listen, learns, um, people of color speaking, listen to their voices not just the Rachel Meadows and the John Olivers. I'm so full of shame right now, but you know what? That's what we said. Do not be full of shame. That's just, that's why I say, but you know what? You, you do the thing and then you learn from it and you work forward. It's just like, that's what we got to be willing to do. Put ourselves out there and do the best we can until we learn better. That's our, that's our mom motto. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Is there any, is there anything we did not cover that you want to make sure uh, that we get out there um, and we'll definitely be putting the links in the show notes, Crystal, so they can learn more about your nonprofit follow-up, um, your GoFundMe, all those good things. But is there anything else that you want to make sure listeners hear from you? Um, no, I do appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm going to join your nonprofit right now. Yeah. As soon as we're off of this. <laughs> yes. And how about you, Shelly? Besides just telling everybody to get out there and vote, we got our primaries going on here in Austin. We have primaries going on and they still need poll workers. So, you know, if you have four, it, it's a paid gig. You only have to be 16 to work the polls. P-O-L-L-S. Oh. Um, and <laughs> yeah. in the, that's a different podcast. It's a whole thing, right? Um, <laughs> you only have to be 16 to uh, to work the polls in, in Texas. So Travis County still needs poll workers. Um, Williamson County still needs poll workers. Um, even if you only have two to four hours to go and help, I would say, please, um, go, go take the election training and, and help out at the polls and vote. Of course, always vote. And vote. Wonderful. Okay. Those are some things that we can do. I mean, that's, that's easy. I mean, that's just a that's couple a of hours. That's yep. a couple of hours. You can do it. And yeah, for sure. Vote. I mean, people are literally going to jail for the ability to vote and for the, privilege and honor of voting Mm -hmm. and for those of us who take it for granted stop it is stop yeah you you need to take it seriously so thank you thank you so much for your time we're honored to hear your story and be able to share it with our audience 
and we're going to continue to follow your story and, and let people know how it progresses. So thank you for letting us be part of it. Thank you. All right. All right. Have, Have a, a wonderful delightful. rest of your snow day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go kick those kids out. Yes. Good luck with the kiddos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for the mom and dot, dot, dot podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you know someone else who could benefit from the episode, please be sure and share it with them. And while we're begging, please subscribe and rate us wherever it is you listen to podcasts. You can find links to all the things we discussed today in our show notes or over at our website, momandpodcast.com with the A N D spelled out. In between shows, find us over at the socials, including our private mom and community Facebook group. The links to that group and all of our socials can be found at momandpodcast.com. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate you more than you know. Now go out there and make your ellipses count.